So yeah, I'm somewhat late to the party on this one. Being away and having to rebench the ROG ally will do that, I guess. And I suppose the question has to be asked. What more is there to say about the RTX 4060 Ti that hasn't already been said at this point? This isn't going to be a deep dive video because the narrative has been firmly established by this point and I don't really disagree with the points raised. Things have gone off the rails with the RTX 4060 Ti and man, what a shame that is. So yeah, the price, it's the same as its predecessor, but performance isn't really that much better. At its best, it matches RTX 3070, which is okay, or even pushes slightly ahead of it with a fair wind, but at its worst, it can actually run slower than the 3060 Ti. Okay, so I've said in the past that comparing with last gen isn't the best reflection of the way people actually upgrade their hardware, but even in looking back to cards like GTX 1070, and 2060 Super, you're not getting the same lifts in performance that the Ada 70 series cards gave you up against their older equivalents. And this is problematic because the whole point of cheaper GPUs is that value is supposed to scale up as we hit the mainstream, not get worse in relation to the more expensive cards. Now there has been stagnation at the lower end of the stack for some time now, but the point is that at $400, we aren't really at the lower end of the stack, not really. But silicon-wise, we seem to be getting there though. The 256-bit interface of the 3060 Ti, 2060 Super, 1070. Well, now we're down to 128 bits. CUDA core counts are also down compared to the prior generation, though strictly speaking, comparisons of different architectures and CUDA core counts only have limited utility. NVIDIA manages to deliver mostly better than 3060 Ti performance in two ways beyond the architectural improvements. Clock speeds are a lot faster, while the brutally cutback memory interface mitigates the loss of bandwidth through a much larger L2 cache. This seems to work at the target 1080p market, uh, diminishes a touch at 1440p and can have issues at both 4K and reconstructed 4K. Now, NVIDIA dubs this as a 1080p card, but I dislike that kind of labeling and marketing, and I think it's better described as a $400 GPU that will attach to whatever monitor a mainstream gamer might have. And I'd expect both 1080p and 1440p displays to be paired with this class of product. Now, we'll go into performance in more detail shortly, but here's a quick look at power consumption and efficiency, which is undeniably impressive. So our efficiency methodology is, as always, to benchmark games with frame rate fully unlocked and the card running flat out, then to divide power consumption in watts by frame rate in FPS. And this gives us joules per frame. The lower that is, the better. Uh, with Control, not an Ada Lovelace friendly game, uh, we're benching this one in high RT at 1440p resolution. 28% reduction in power per frame up against the 3060 Ti, rising to a 44% reduction up against 2060 Super. A strong start with a game where the generational gains in performance are not spectacular. Uh, there's a similar showing with Dying Light 2, again with high RT at 1440p, with a 31% reduction in power per frame compared to the last gen 3060 Ti rising to a 50.5% reduction up against 2060 Super, which is, you know, super. <laughs> um, moving on to rasterization, uh, Forza Horizon 5 has been an exceptionally efficient performer on all ADA cards, and in all cases, it's never troubled the power limit of the GPU, which can't be said for prior generation alternatives. Uh, the same thing happens here with similarly impressive results. Power reduction per frame is in the region of 44% up against 3060 Ti, rising to 55% when compared against the 2060 Super. Sticking with rasterization, with Hitman running at max settings, uh, a 34% reduction in power per frame up against the 4060 Ti's immediate predecessor, which boosts up to a 47% reduction when we compare it against the 2060 Super. So the efficiency is there, and in the form of the Founders Edition card I was sent for testing, the physical attributes are great too. Very similar to the 4070, of course, the same arrangement of display ports and HDMI 2.1, while power is still using the new socket. Although expect partner cards to optionally revert to standard PCIe inputs. Performance-wise, the story's out there right now anyway, right? 
Price is static versus 3060 Ti, but frame rate increases don't shift that much. In fairness, things are better with ray tracing, so let's start here. With Dying Light 2, for example, it's a relatively strong start for the 4060 Ti, as at our preferred resolution for this card, 1440p, we're effectively on par with the last gen 3070, and it's actually 5 percentage points ahead of that card at 1080p. Skipping over to prior generation comparisons, 17 point lead over the 3060 Ti, and a 1.8 to 2 times performance multiplier up against 2070 and 2060 Super. Not bad, but consider this best case scenario stuff. 3060 Ti is pretty weak at RT in Cyberpunk 2077 when presented with native res rendering, so both 4060 Ti and 3070 are ahead. Again, things are looking pretty promising, but interestingly, looking back at 2060 Super and 2070, the performance multipliers are now starting to shrink. We're now in uh, 1.7 to 1.9 times frame rate increases. Still though, still not a bad upgrade. Just remember though, RT is the strong suit of the 4060 Ti, but spoilers, the gen on gen increases decline as we look at Remedy's control. To varying extents, this one's been a banana skin game for every 40 series card, except the 4090, and here there's just a 10 point lead over 3060 Ti, 3070 10 points ahead, and the performance increases up against Turing look shakier. Here 4060 Ti, 66% faster than 2060 Super, and just 51 points ahead of a 2070. I could go on and the results are all in the Eurogamer web review based on our entire benchmark suite. But to reiterate, RT is where the 4060 Ti produces its best results, but those results range from 10% better to a 3060 Ti at worst, and on par or a bit faster than 3070 at best. Uh, we've been looking at native resolution rendering so far, but at 1440p with RT on a card of this class, typically you'd be using upscaling, right? So this does tend to give the 4060 Ti a small boost, so for Dying Light 2 here, at 1440p DLSS quality mode, you're inching ahead of the 3070 again. Plus, you can invoke frame gen, so your high 50s on the Ampere card rises to high 60s and 70s on the 4060 Ti. Of course, there is a small latency deficit to factor in, but it does look impressive. However, something that is slightly odd is that in some scenarios, there can be frame time irregularities. Zooming in on millisecond viewing like this emphasizes it perhaps, but it's more difficult to see in actual gameplay, but it is there and it probably needs addressing, especially when you see some of the other DLSS3 stuff we have to show you later on in this video. And while we're talking about RT, let's talk RT Overdrive. Uh, looks peachy, right? Well, I took those settings into gameplay and while everything looks great to begin with, visiting the perennial trouble spot that is Tom's Diner and the Cherry Blossom Marketplace caused performance to absolutely tank with frame gen going haywire. Um, switching to 1080p DLSS quality mode with frame gen and then uh, reloading the game solved the issues and I could negotiate the trouble areas with decent performance. We won't know this for sure until the 16 gig 4060 Ti is available, but frame gen adds to the memory footprint and I wouldn't be surprised if we were hitting VRAM limits at 1440p there. And that may also explain some stutter I experienced at 1440p, uh, even when performance was looking good overall. But I digress really, 4060 Ti does RT well overall and an RT overdrive experience at anything from 60 to 90 odd frames per second without the optimization mod at 1080p, I'd say that's pretty impressive. Things take a turn when we look at rasterization and looking at Cyberpunk at Ultra, 1440p, once again, basically there's no performance improvement up against the 3060 Ti. You double performance up against the 1070, but the gains versus 2060 Super and 2070 are risable. Four to five years of advancement in GPU tech and a couple of process nodes later, and the end result is 26 to 30 percent more performance. Gap widens at 1080p, but not by much. 4060 Ti is 40 to 46% to the better against the brace of Turing cards there. Kind of academic, I guess. This is a benchmark and not the way I'd be playing the game on this hardware. But even from that academic perspective, I honestly think it should be doing better. 
And if, as I suspect, this game is bandwidth heavy, we may well be looking at scenarios where the big L2 cache cannot match the capabilities of a much wider memory interface. Forza Horizon 5 has delivered some startling boosts over prior architectures in our other Ada reviews, and it's also where we get to see one of our best rasterization results against last gen, effectively on par across the bench with the RTX 3070. You get a 2.2 times performance boost over the 2016 vintage 1070, and the generational leap versus the Turing cards. Uh, it's higher than norm, you're 73 points ahead of the 2060 Super and 64 ahead of the 2070. And that's okay, but perhaps not okay more holistically when it's at the top end of expectations in rasterization performance compared to other titles. So for example, in F122, you're getting twice the performance of the GTX 1070 here, but the lead over the 2060 Super drops to a meager 40%. Yes, the 70 class cards offered better gen on gen gains, Ada versus Turing, but they were more expensive. So maybe expecting similar generational improvement is asking too much. And well, to counter that, I think my answer would be that once again, as we go down the stack and enter the mainstream, relative performance boosts ideally should be increasing, not decreasing. I mean, that's one of the reasons why 3060 Ti reviewed as well as it did back in the day. Could go on, but the variability in performance means that for every decent result, a gotcha is just around the corner. Consider this for example, Hitman 3 sees the 4060 Ti deliver a 16 point performance advantage over 3060 Ti, and 3070 is just 2% ahead at 1440p, which is pretty good. But then you look at a Plague Tale Requiem, and today's $400 GPU is just 5% ahead of 2020's $400 GPU. And Returnal has the same issue, it's just 5 points clear of 3060 Ti. So in a lot of cases, with more modern releases, you can factor in DLSS 3 frame generation, which adds the perception of more fluidity. And I do consider this to be a very worthwhile feature. We'll talk a bit more about it later. But I also consider this to be a value added feature, not a crutch on which to rest when base performance isn't good enough. I'd also like to point out that there are scenarios where 4060 Ti is only on par or can actually be slower than 3060 Ti. Typically only happens at 4K or reconstructed 4K, but here we are in Control's Corridor of Doom where performance is so, so close to the 3060 Ti just as it is in F122, where you really couldn't tell the two apart if you saw them running side by side. I mean, practically identical. And here in Forza Horizon 5, 3060 Ti actually moves ahead of the new 4060 Ti. Now the chances are that you're not going to be using this new card as a 4K GPU, right? But then again, 4K DLSS, why not? Even with the lower base resolution, there still appears to be a fair amount happening at the higher resolution internally, enough to depress performance by a similar degree. DLSS 3 isn't going to be helping you here either. FrameGen reduces performance actually, likely because we're running out of VRAM, something the game actually warns us about on screen. And check out the haywire frame times there again. This is not how the game should be presenting. I've not discussed the 8 gigs of VRAM yet, but let's get into it. Our benchmarks are based on mature games for stability's sake, and the fact that newer titles with problems receive rapid patches that may influence results. So actually the benchmark suite at 1080p and 1440p is not that unduly affected by the limited memory, as far as we can tell. I guess an outlier example is, once again, Forza Horizon 5. Here at 1440p, there's just a 3 percentage point overall boost to frame rate with DLSS 3 versus DLSS 2. But really, the bigger story here is that once again, frame pacing appears to be broken. Frame gen requires the title to keep another full image in memory, and it's clear the 4060 Ti is suffering. On par performance from DLSS 3 with kind of micro stuttering issues at 1440p certainly isn't great, but an actual reduction in performance at 4K with what could be described as macro stuttering issues, man, something's really up with this game. Right, let's make it perfectly clear where we stand on the 8 gigabyte memory issue. Developers need to accept that there's a massive amount of 8 gig cards in the market. So it's not right that the likes of Forspoken, Hogwarts Legacy and The Last of Us Part 1 
launch in a terrible state when you're forced to bust down to the medium texture setting, which really looks awful. But at the same time, at this price point, buying an 8GB GPU in 2023 with a view to future-proofing for the years ahead just doesn't make sense. Cross-gen is reaching its conclusion. PS5 is the prime target for AAA game development. A 60-class card should be capable of matching and exceeding what the consoles are doing. And yes, that includes the same quality textures or better. But yeah, absolutely in the meantime, 8GB card owners shouldn't need to be waiting weeks or even months in some cases for fixes for their hardware. But at least in the case of The Last of Us Part 1, the fix does appear to be pretty comprehensive. Returning to the 4060 Ti though, the performance is there to outperform the PS5 and Series X. Uh, the RT features are way ahead and so, well, obviously, I'd like to use them. But the BVH structures required for ray tracing are also hungry for memory. I'd really like to use frame gen without hitting VRAM limits. More memory makes that happen and it's clear that 8 gigs is already being strained to its limits. Which brings me back to the upgrade path discussion. GTX 1070, 2060 Super, 2070 even, all 8 gig cards, right? If you had problems with Forspoken, T-Loop 1 and Hogwarts at launch, you would have those problems with the 4060 Ti too, even if it was 10 times as powerful, which it isn't. Now Nvidia does have an answer to this, and that answer is to offer a 16GB variant of the 4060 Ti due out uh, via partner cards in a couple of months. But the $100 price increase, a 25% price premium, is shocking. Uh, let's put it this way, if your silicon can only deliver such small gains gen on gen, well, what else could be done to get a well-rounded value package together? Delivering more memory and peace of mind via future-proofing, well, that's the way forward, right? A 16 gig 4060 Ti for $500 doesn't offer good value, and it doesn't help that for another $100 on top of that with the 4070, you might get less memory, but you get so much more performance. It's as if Nvidia is trying to plug a gap in the stack with a $500 product uh, that wouldn't be there otherwise when really this is what the $400 offering should have looked like to begin with. So the ignominy ends here then. And I do want to offer up a positive use case scenario for the 4060 Ti that a prior generation card won't offer. In the AAA space, we're facing a problem right now with games that are really CPU heavy, and not everyone has a 13900K or a 7800X 3D to power their way past the problems if indeed that is possible, even with those high-end chips. 4060 Ti is likely to be paired with a mainstream processor, and there's genuine utility here for DLSS 3 in helping to mitigate CPU-heavy games. So we're looking at Hogwarts Legacy at high settings here, DLSS 2 quality mode versus DLSS 3. Perceived frame rate is a lot higher, but what also intrigued me is that the stuttering is reduced. There are far fewer frame time spikes here with DLSS 3 enabled. Very interesting behavior and a boon for less powerful PCs, I'd say. That said, there's not much help with frame health in a Plague Tale Requiem in populous, dense areas, but the overall fluidity of the game is improved and a mainstream CPU like my 13400F here goes from delivering a sub 60fps experience to one that's at 80 to over 100 frames per second. Uh, Marvel Spider-Man and Miles Morales optimized settings here, so basically close to PlayStation 5, but with those added RT shadows. Interesting stuff here, as you can see that DLSS 2 doesn't add a huge amount to performance as we hit CPU limits in this run through the Times Square area. But DLSS 3 puts you into high refresh rate range, and again, curiously, there seems to be less stutter. So yeah, we can join the pile on with the RTX 4060 Ti and highlight its uh, disappointing performance boosts and memory issues because at this point it's an easy target, right? I mean, all of the bad stuff about the card, it's all true, but I thought it was worth giving the product a fair shake in the kind of PC it's likely to find its way into. And there are some plus points there. That said, if there's the sense that we're having to dig deep in finding them, I get that. And I still find it baffling that this product shipped as it did when the issues are so easy and obvious to highlight. But it is what it is. 
So that's the end of this review and yeah, apologies for the delay and apologies in advance for the 7600 review delay. But like, subscribe, share if this review was of value and as usual, please do consider the DF Supporter Program for high quality video downloads, bonus material, early access and a bunch of great stuff, including a wonderful community. Uh, but that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.